Our scripture reading this morning is the same one as we had last week and the same one as we will have next week. Uh, It's Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, and so I invite you to follow along as I read this for us once more. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Hopefully you remember the context that we're working with here in Galatians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul has been trying to show us that the way we live our life is an indicator of the faith that we say we have. It shows whether or not it's valid. And those people who are just professing faith continue to live like everybody else in the world. And then he says, but if you're living in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is trying to do something in you. He's beginning to make changes in you. And it it takes a long time. It takes, well, a lifetime. But we should be able to see some changes. And that's what the fruit of the Spirit really is here. And basically, what what the Lord is trying to do, or what the Holy Spirit is doing in us, is he's gradually making us more and more like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit, all all those things that attract us to Jesus, all those character traits that, that draw us to him like a magnet, well, that's what he's trying to develop within us. And if you're like me, you look at our society and we say, oh my gosh, Do we need this in our society? And these are are simple things, but they are very, very important things. Now, again, we're going to remind you of this every week. This is not a way to gain salvation. In other words, Paul is not saying you need to be more loving, joyful, you know, peaceful. You need you need to do all these things. If if you just work harder at these things, then, then you could earn your way into heaven. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that these things are a way to get to heaven. He's saying these things are the result of those who have truly put their faith in Christ. So don't don't get this mixed up. Don't make this into a, a way of earning salvation. We can't earn salvation. But once we are in Christ's family, he loves us too much to just let us wander around. He wants us to grow. So that's where we're at here. If you want to read more on this, uh, Rick and I have benefited a great deal from Jerry Bridges' book, The The Practice of Godliness. It's a wonderful book, and you're going to hear me quote uh, Bridges several times in the next couple of weeks. Okay, what we're going to look at today are the second set of three characteristics. Rick looked at love, joy, and peace. We're going to look at at patience, kindness, and goodness. Now, patience, I don't know anybody that doesn't say... I could use a little more patience. I mean, everybody says that, right? Everybody says that. And none of us want the trials that often bring patience. As I was reading through this, it seems like the Bible is it's talking about patience or long-suffering. Don't you like that? Long-suffering. That's what patience is. I don't know about you, but I like short suffering. <laughs> this long suffering. I don't like this. You know, a little inconvenience is okay, but ooh, endurance, patience. Mm-hmm. I, I don't even like to wait for the three cars to go by in a traffic jam on Main Street in La Harp. You know, what is the deal here? Why is it taking so long to get out on the Main Street? That really frustrates me. Okay, there are several areas where there, we need patience. Number one, patience when we are mistreated. Let me read your quote from Bridges, and, or you can read it with me on the screen. The as- this aspect of patience is the ability to suffer a long time under the mistreatment of others without growing resentful or bitter. The occasions for exercising this quality are numerous. They vary from malicious wrongs all the way to seemingly innocent practical jokes. They include ridicule, scorn, insults, undeserved rebukes, as well as outright persecution. The Christian who is the victim of office politics or organizational power plays must react with long suffering. The believing husband or wife who is rejected or mistreated by an unbelieving spouse needs this kind of patience. In other words, this is the ability 
Or this is the characteristic that allows us to hang on, to keep trusting God, even when we're being hammered and there's nothing we can do about it. The best example of this is Joseph, who was uh, beaten up by his brothers, who was sold into slavery, who was falsely charged with rape when he was completely innocent, who was sent to jail, who interpreted the dream for the, I always say the butcher baker and candlestick maker, but it was the cupbearer and the baker, and, and, and then the guy forgot. He said, I'll remember you to Pharaoh. I'll tell him that you're this great guy. He forgot. And so he languished in prison for all those years, and yet Joseph continued to be faithful. And at the end of his life, he said to his brothers, what you intended for harm, God has used for good. That's the attitude that patience is here. It says, I don't know why this is happening to me, but I believe that God is sovereign over all and he's going to do what is right. He's going to either vindicate me or he's going to use this for my good. The second place where we need patience is when we are provoked. And you say, well, isn't that the same thing? No, the difference here is when we are um, mistreated is when we don't have any power to do anything to fight back. When we are provoked, now we can get even. You know, it's, a, it's an employee that acts up, and now we can, we can nail them. And the idea here is that when we can get even, we are patient and have a restraint of power. And we don't do what we could do because we are going to trust God to judge. That's very difficult because, you know, we get hammered enough when we can't do anything about it, and we, when we can... Oh, we would like to because it makes us feel better. But the idea here is that we are supposed to act in the same way as Jesus, who even though he was persecuted, he kept his mouth shut and he continued to love and he continued to keep his eye on where God was leading him. And we want to be like God treats us, who does not treat us as we deserve but instead shows restraint and mercy and grace and long-suffering towards us. So that's the second area where we need patience, when, when we are provoked. Third, we need patience with the imperfections of others. In other words, when other people don't act the way that we think they should act, we get a little impatient. And, and I'm pretty sure that all of you are that way. I know I'm that way. When, when, when people don't act the way I think they should act, I get a little irritated. Again, let me read to you from Jerry Bridges. I, I don't really like what he writes here because it's very convicting. It may be the driver ahead of you who's driving too slowly. <laughs> that ever happened to you? Yeah. Or the friend who's late for an appointment. Or the neighbor who's inconsiderate. More often than not, it's an unconscious action of some family member whose irritating habit is magnified because of close daily association. The kind of patience it takes to overlook these circumstances is probably demanded of us most often within our own families or Christian fellowships. Well, I think Jerry Bridges has something here, doesn't he? That we need patience with each other, and we need to remind ourselves that, that all of us have issues. We're all working on things. We, we aren't there yet. We need to remember that, that, you know, our family members probably find some irritating things in us. We say, no, that can't be, because I'm doing everything appropriately. No, not, not at all. And so there's this sense in which we again go back to the character of God, and we remember Jesus' patience with people. He, he, his patience with the disciples. You know, if, you were, if I was Jesus, I would have slapped them sometimes. You know, just, oh, you guys are so dense. You're just not getting this. Could you just, mm. But he didn't. He patiently continued to teach. He understood who they were. And even Judas, who he knew was going to betray him, he continued to love him right up to the end. Jesus had patience, understanding that we are people in process. And that's important to remember. I think his... Um, his idea about patience at home. Boy, isn't that good? We're going to talk about this a little bit more later um, in the kindness area because our home is really the place where this laboratory starts. There's a fourth area. Um, oh, wait a minute. i got a Bridges quote here, I think. I guess I already read it. All right. 
The fourth area is patience in the times of adversity. Hmm. <laughs> the times when we don't understand. The times when we can be angry at God. The times when circumstances just aren't going our way. And we're just getting hammered again and again. And, and you know, as we look at our prayer list and we see people who, it just seems like it's not fair. Why is it that some people get hit with wave after wave after wave of things? Why is that? It's hard to be patient at those times and to believe that God is going to answer prayer in his time and in his way. I mean, have you ever prayed for something and, and it just doesn't seem like God's listening? This is where the patience is necessary, where we hang on and we say, God is wise, God is loving, God always does what is right. He loves me, and I'm, I'm just going to trust him here. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to wait, wait on the Lord. Jason, in his new album, has a, a song called Stolen, and this is, this is what he writes. And, and I think most of you know that, that Jason and I walked through a very difficult period together. And so I, I really understand what he's saying here. He says, if my life never would have been broken, then my hands would have never been open, and my heart never would have been stolen. But your love came to me in my lowest, and I've been singing ever since that moment. Hmm. That's good. Job, the, the quintessential uh, example of somebody who had patience and adversity. I mean, there are times where I'm, I'm a little annoyed by Job, because how can anybody have that kind of attitude? He lost everything. His ten children, his business, his help, his health. He lost all of it in a very short period of time. And yet, what he writes is, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Really? <laughs> yeah. Job was the most righteous man in the world because he understood this idea of being patient with God. Saying, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I don't get it at all. It's kind of ticking me off, but I trust you. And that's really what patience is all about. Okay, so that's patience. Next is kindness. Aren't you glad that he put kindness in here? Because this is becoming a lost character in our society. Everybody seems to have an edge. There, there seems to be this, this idea in our society that you don't let anybody, you know, you, you, you fight for everything. Everybody is ready for war at the slightest imperfection, the slightest offense. And here we're being talk, told that, that we are to be kind like Jesus was. Listen to this quote from Tim Keller. He writes, Kindness, an ability to serve others practically in a way which makes me vulnerable which comes from having a deep inner security. Its opposite is envy, which leaves me unable to rejoice in another's job. And it's, I think it's supposed to be joy. And its fake alternative is manipulative good deeds, doing good for others so I can congratulate myself and feel I am good enough for others or for God. What kindness really is, is the ability to see beyond ourselves. The problem with the world is that, that we, we all feel like we're the star of the show and everybody else is here to serve us. When the truth is, we, are, we just have a walk-on part, you know, in this story called life. We are all bit players, and, it, and if we don't cooperate together, this isn't going to work. So kindness is a matter of being able to see beyond yourself to see other people. Let me give you a list of some of the things that we need to see. The mom who's exhausted from caring for her children, managing the house and trying to work. The dad who needs something to relieve the stress of the demands on him. The worker who's longing for someone to encourage them in their work, to see that they're doing something positive. The teenager who needs somebody to see anything positive in them, the one devastated in need of forgiveness and restoration. Even that person who, who just ran into the store to get one item 
and is now behind you in your shopping cart full of groceries. It's seeing the sick person that needs love and care and not probing questions. It's seeing the person seeking truth that wants honest answer, not condemnation or lectures. It's the animal that needs a drink. It's the child that longs for someone to just get down on their level and look them in the eye. The person who is speaking, even though no one is listening. The person trying to leave a parking lot, but no one will give them the chance to get out. Keep that in mind tomorrow night at the fireworks. Um, the one who can't keep up on the things at home because of the crisis they're going through. The person who's made horrible choices in the past and needs someone to give them a chance to prove that they are better than that one mistake. That's where kindness comes in. Being able to see in another person a need and, and caring about that. I suspect there have been times where you longed for somebody to just be kind with you. And if you've experienced kindness in a, in a profound way, that, that jumps to your head right away and you go, I know what that is. I know what that kindness is because there was a time when, and you know. Jerry Bridges again writes, our natural inclination is to show kindness only to those for whom we have some natural affinity. Family, friends, likable neighbors. But God shows kindness to those who are most despicable. The ungrateful and wicked. Have you ever tried to be kind to someone who was ungrateful? Unless God's grace was working in your heart in a significant way, your reaction to this ingratitude may well have been, I'll never do anything for him again. But God doesn't turn his back on the ungrateful. And so Jesus says to us, love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Hmm. Good stuff. So kindness is seeing other people and recognizing that, that you know, everybody, everybody we meet has got some kind of ache in their soul. Everybody is, is looking for somebody to just really see them instead of to look past them. Now, the next trait is goodness. And we say, well, I, what's the difference between kindness and goodness? And, and this is tough. Um, they're siblings. They're, they're related to each other. They, they go hand in hand. But kindness is, is, uh, is an attitude in your heart Goodness is acting on that attitude, okay? It, it's, a, it's a small distinction, but these two go together. That we see somebody, and we see their hurt, and now, out of goodness, we say, I want to do something to help them. I want to do something to meet a need here. Jesus did this. Remember, he, he washed the feet of the disciples? He wanted to show them something, he wanted to teach them something, but he wanted them to remember this forever, and so at the Last Supper, he, the guy who's in charge, the guy who should be served, got down and he washed the feet of his disciples. He took the job of a servant. And he said, as I have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. Now, he wasn't really talking about washing people's feet. He was talking about an attitude of service. As I have served you, so you should serve each other. Why? Because people are in need. And it doesn't have to be complicated things. It, it doesn't have to be um, big things. It can be little things. A, a little note, a phone call, a stopping and, and actually talking to somebody and saying, hey, how are you doing? Sharing in their joy, sharing in their sorrow. There's all kinds of things. You know, Job's friends were best when they just kept their mouths shut and sat and cried with him. That's when they really ministered to him. And you and I both know that when we're hurting, we don't want lectures, we don't want explanations, just help me grieve. So we can do those kinds of things. I ran across a, a great illustration, and um, it, it's troubling to me a little bit that this was in a seminary, but it was at a seminary. And this professor was really good at object lessons. You know, he, he learned from Jesus that sometimes you teach best by an object lesson. And so everybody came into class one day and there was this big dartboard up in the classroom. And we go, mm, I wonder what this is all about. And a whole bunch of darts there and paper and, and crayons and stuff. And he said, okay, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to let some of the anger out of our life. We're going we're to deal with some things. So what I want you to do is I want you to draw a picture 
of somebody who has hurt you. I want you to draw a picture of somebody who, who wounded you deeply. And so they went at this with a vengeance. They, they knew exactly who it was. They, somebody, you know, this guy uh, stole my, my girlfriend, or this person uh, was mad at me, or this person treated me shamefully, and then so on down the line. And this one girl's telling this story, and she says, you know, I, I, I got it down to even the acne on the face. And I, I thought, this is, I got this picture down. And he said, okay, now what's going to happen here is one by one, we're going to put the picture up on the dartboard, and we're going to throw darts at it. Ooh, and they got into this, which is what's troubling about this. These were seminary students. Okay, shouldn't you guys be a little bit better than this? But that's beside the point. And so they're winging these darts at this and just really just ripping up these pictures, and they're feeling good. And then finally he said, oh, we're going to have to quit now. And the people who didn't get to throw the darts were really mad. I didn't get to throw my dart. And then he said, well, we're, we're about out of time. And so he, he, he took the bullseye down, and behind it was a picture of Jesus. And this picture was all ripped up. And all he said to them was this. Jesus said, as you have done it to the least of these, my brothers, you have done it to me. Well, a lesson they never forgot. And hopefully a lesson that we will never forget. Galatians uh, 6.10 tells us that, that we should start by being good to the people that are closest to us. That we should start with a household of faith. And, and he means other believers. That, that if we can't be kind and treat each other with goodness, how in the world is the rest of the world going to believe that Jesus loves them if we can't love each other? And, and the same thing holds true in our households. If we can't show consideration for each other at home, why would anybody believe us when we say that Jesus loves and cares if his followers don't have any evidence of that in their life? You know what happens. We, we get involved in, in life and, and marriage and and we're busy, we're doing all kinds of stuff, and, and we're running these parallel lives, and, and we never touch, we never see. We, we are like business partners. And, and I think Paul would say, that's got to stop. That somehow we have to show the world that Christians in their homes can care about each other, can see each other, can, can be patient with each other, and, and then the world will notice and say, I, I want what they have. Instead of saying, their life's no better than mine. Why would I want to follow their God? These are simple things. But what profound truths these are. Patience, kindness, and goodness are things that have a profound impact. These characteristics increase joy in our living and impact the people in our lives. The problem is that, that you and I, I, maybe I'm speaking for you here, that I get easily discouraged. You try to be kind, you try to show good things to people, and you receive indifference, hostility, perhaps even worse, a sense of entitlement from others. And we ask ourselves, what's the use? Why bother caring at all? But what happens, and it's happening to many of us after we've become discouraged, then we move to cynicism. And we believe everybody is trying to rip you off. And from cynicism, we, we move to self-absorption. I'm going to do what's right for me. That's all that matters. And by this, what people mean is, I have to pursue what will make me happy whether or not it hurts other people. And this, in turn, will turn into isolation. We're all by ourselves in the world and wonder... How come life is so lonely? The best response to this attitude of discouragement is to say, what if Jesus had gotten discouraged with me? I'm so glad he didn't. But he continues to love. He doesn't, doesn't give up on me. He doesn't give up on you. The best part of exercising the fruit of the Spirit is the pleasure that it brings to our Father in heaven. 
His approval, his, his well done is worth every effort. But, but that's not the only benefit. A simple act of kindness and goodness can, can pay it forward. If, if that gets started like a, a bunch of dominoes, you know, that, that go around, our act of kindness could change somebody's day and, and, and that change in their attitude could affect other people and that'll affect other people and so on down the line. And if we do this consistently, people will be drawn to you like a magnet because you will unfortunately be unique in a harsh and angry world. We are all starved for people who will be kind, good, and patient with us. As we walk in the Spirit, we will begin to see people and not problems and obstacles to be overcome. As we walk in the Spirit, we'll be touched by the stories of those who are around us. Life will be richer for us and for them. We will learn things about people that will warm our hearts and at other times we'll learn things that will break our hearts. As we demonstrate goodness, we will see more smiles and we'll look more people right in the eye. You will be remembered. And if you're patient, you will begin to see the Holy Spirit starting to change your family, change our church, change our community. And maybe see him change a little bit of the world through us. So let's pray. Oh, Father, these seem like such simple things. Patience, kindness, goodness. Why are they so hard to practice? Father, we pray that you would help us to buck the trend of our society to be people who see beyond ourselves, to be able to see potential, to see the creative genius that you've put in every single person. Help us to see each other as you do. And when we face the trials of life, help us to trust you, really trust you. And hang on and wait patiently, confidently. Help us to this end, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.